and um, and begin by uh, talking about our goals tonight, which Megan mentioned. We want to explore critical moments in Virginia history to better understand systemic racism. Virginia, my family lives in Virginia. I've spent a lot of time in Virginia. Virginia plays a unique role in the history of racism in this country, the development of racism. And so we're gonna try to understand how racism operates by looking at that history. We also wanna deepen our, our understanding of race and racism generally and identify opportunities for racial justice. So this is an important part of why we did this workshop. Sometimes we feel that racism is just a never ending series of bad things that happens to our communities. But in fact, there's also a history of resistance, of multiracial solidarity and resistance to racism. And we want to highlight that as well. One of the, there's many kind of assumptions we make when we uh, uh, do this workshop, but a key one is that in this country, racism is rooted in two systems. One, the enslavement of Black people, and two was the in genocide and land theft of Native people. And in fact, those two things are also the biggest generators of wealth in US history, right? This massive amounts of wealth in the hands of a small number of people, it, it originates in these two systems. Oops, wrong way. So uh, first volunteer, can someone volunteer to read the first slide here? Your country, how came it yours? Before the pilgrims landed, we were here. W.E. Boy, Du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois, the souls of Black folks. Thank you. So the origin story of this country is the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. Does anyone know what year that was? It's okay if you don't, like most of us don't remember the history, right? It was, it was in, uh, 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 1620, I believe, 1620. But a year before the pilgrims arrived at Plymouth Rock, the first Africans uh, land in Virginia. And in fact, you know, going back thousands of years to time immemorial, Native people were here. So why is 1620 the origin story instead of the earlier date in Virginia? I think it's because to avoid the, the question of slavery, right? It's like if the origin story of the country is in Jamestown, then slavery is part of the original story. But by placing it in Plymouth, it's like, oh, these, these people escaping religious persecution came here and landed in an unpopulated paradise and built this society. And of course, we know that isn't true. So it's just something to think about as we get started. Why is it Plymouth and not Jamestown that is the origin story? So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to use uh, something called Reader's Theater where we're gonna ask all of you to be um, play parts in scenes, four scenes from Virginia history. And we need two volunteers for each scene. And we're gonna, I'm gonna be the narrator and narrate a little bit. And then I'm gonna ask you all to read from the slide the, wor the, the words as they might've come from these historical figures. So we need two, volunteers for 1619 Jamestown. Can uh, get two folks to raise their hand or, or on the screen or on your camera. Um, anybody? 
Okay, I'm okay. Now I see hands. Sorry. Um, I see so, Troy Jackson. Great. I got Rachel. Try and there's going to be opportunities for others. So the first, uh, the first volunteer, uh, Rachel, do you want to? You're going to be John Rolf, and the second volunteer, you're going to be John Punch. And I'm just going to start out with a little scenario. Slavery did not begin in 1619, but the first Africans are brought to the English colonies of North America in August of 1619. It begins the process that becomes the system of slavery in the United States. Rachel, do you want to read John Rolfe? Yes, thank you. I am John Rolfe an English settler here in Virginia. You might know me more by my famous wife, Pocahontas, now deceased. This August, I was a witness as an English pirate ship, the White Lion, brought about 20 Africans into port. I believe they are the first Africans to see these shores. They were taken by the Portuguese slave ship, the English freighted. Our colony traded them in exchange for food. Since these Africans are baptized Christians, we will take them into indentured servitude to earn their keep like many of the Englishmen here in the colony of Virginia. Maybe one of my sons will buy one or two servants to work on our plantations, Verana Farms. All right, and our second volunteer, John, we're gonna read John Punch. Who was our second volunteer? I missed the second one. For some reason, I can't see the bigger group of you. Oh, here we go. That's better. Anybody who raised their hand can read that the second one. Be John Punch for us, please. Carolyn, go ahead. I am John Punch. I believe I was born in Cameroon in Africa, but no one knows for sure. As a child, I was kidnapped by Portuguese slavers and taken to the new world. But our ship was raided on the way to Mexico and I was taken by the English here to Virginia. I'm now an indentured servant, but just 20 years in the future, in 1640, I will try to escape Virginia with some English indentured servants. My punishment will be to become a permanent servant. In other words, I will be enslaved. My English counterparts will not be enslaved. I will be the first permanent slave in the English colonies, the first of many. So what's going on in this scenario? Can someone reflect on it? What, what are these two roles? What's happening here? Anybody can jump up. There's no right answer. There's a lots of things to this observe. This is Barbara Harris. John Rolfe is a witness to uh, the beginning of an atrocity. And John Punch is the victim. Yep. Absolutely. So John Rolfe is there and witnesses the ship landing. And, and John Punch is one of those people. He may not have been on that first ship, but he's one of those who comes after. And what, what do you notice about this? Is there anything here that's different from the story you've known or you've heard? What I hear is, is or understand is back in those times that, um, Black people were not allowed to read the Bible, but it says here that the Africans, Americans, uh, Africans are baptized Christians. Right. So it didn't mean that they were allowed to read the Bible, but they, because they had been captured by the Portuguese, 
they were baptized Christians. They probably, the first ones probably spoke Portuguese. And this is an important distinction in the earliest Virginia colonies is the distinction was not between black and white, it was between Christian and so-called savage, right? Let's go to some of the lessons from this first earliest scenario. First, slavery and what becomes the United States begins in this moment, before the landing at Plymouth, right? 1619, but it's not, slavery as we know it, as it becomes. It begins as temporary indentured servitude for Blacks and whites. Originally, African and European indentured servants were treated similarly, though not the same. But quickly, and you saw with John Punch, within his lifetime, that ends, right? So we know John Punch was a historical person and he's believed to be the first uh, permanent slave. So as a form of punishment, he is made to be a slave for life um, for the first time in the, in the English colonies here. So we can see that these uh, systems are changing but it, it solidifies very quickly. Are there any questions about this moment, this scene? And we'll move on to the next one. All right, I need two more volunteers for Jamestown 1676. And if you volunteer, you go ahead and unmute and turn on your camera so we can see you. And while you think about it, I'm going to read the narration. Bacon's Rebellion is the first uprising in the British colonies. It unites Black and white, but for anti-Indian goals. The reaction to, to the rebellion helps define differences between Black, white, and Native that still live with us today. Who's our first volunteer? Anybody, I'm going to call on all of you eventually. Shauna. Shauna, you're going to read Nathaniel Bacon. I am Nathaniel Bacon. I was born into a rich merchant family in England and came to Virginia as a planter. I own two large farms and I am on the governor's council. But I have become the figurehead of a movement here opposing the powerful plantation owners and the corrupt governor of Virginia colony. Freed European and African indentured servants, small landowners, and others from all classes in Virginia unite around my banner. We will burn the capital Jamestown to the ground, chase the governor out, and make a declaration of the people demanding rights as citizens. This is part two for Nathaniel. Okay. Um, what united us against the elites was our demand that the Virginia government remove the original inhabitants of this land from their traditional lands, fight the Indian tribes who get in the way, and let us free men take the lands for ourselves. We believe the land belongs to good Christians, not to the savage Indians. For nearly a year, my small army of 500 men roams around Virginia, killing the native people and fighting the government troops. Eventually I die and the rebellion ends, but our rebellion inspires another uprising 100 years from now. All right, and what is, what is the 100 year later event that happens? the American Revolution, right? Uh, we, our second volunteer, I think I saw uh, Mary Johns. I'll do it. All right, you wanna be William Berkeley, please. 
I am William Berkeley, the governor of the English colony of Virginia. I am on a ship sailing back to England because I failed to stop Bacon and his rebellion. But the small group of Englishmen that ruled Virginia has learned a hard lesson. They will pass laws over the next few years that will divide the coalition that united under Bacon. The descendants of African indentured servants will become enslaved for life and their children too. Freed Negroes will be barred from owning European indentured servants. Virginia will reduce and eventually eliminate indentured servitude to be replaced by slavery. Negroes will be barred from Indian lands and Indian land will increasingly be taken by military force to appease English farmers. Great, thank you to the readers. Um, so let's jump into the lessons and then discuss a little. So this is this interesting moment. Bacon's rebellion was admired by the uh, founders of the American Revolution, but it was also the moment in which the concept of whiteness, this idea that there was a racial difference between European born uh, uh, people, it's invented in law. They have to create a new concept in order to distinguish between whites and blacks. So we believe race is a construct, it's an invention. It's not, bi biological race is not real. And it's this moment when it is defined in Virginia law in a way that, that trickles down, affects the whole country. And the rules of race, which were somewhat unformed before the Bacon's Rebellion, they become solidified, right? So these hard rules of difference between natives, blacks, and whites get established. And a small group of elites represented by William Berkeley and, the, and these elites really benefit from the racial division. They create this system in order to hold on to their power. So what are your observations, reflections about this moment of Bacon's Rebellion? Is it a new idea? I know that in Virginia, they, Bacon's Rebellion is taught in schools. What did you learn about Bacon's Rebellion? Anybody? First I ever heard of it right here. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting moment in history that we don't know a lot about, um, but it's crucial because it's when, you know, the, you know, it's probably one of the most pivotal moments in, in racial relations in the US. What about the idea that freed blacks and freed whites were basically saying, we want the colony to go take these Indian lands so that we can have them, right? So they're building a, a black white solidarity but they're building it on the basis of saying, you know, we're the true free people. We don't want those savages to have the land. But weren't they here first? Yeah, it was all their land. One interesting thing, think about this. If you have a system where a small number of, of men who have property are citizens and can vote and have rights. And then you have a system of indentured servitude where oh, after some amount of time, these other men are become free. 
well, what does it mean to be free, but have no property? So in a case, what they were basically saying is, you know, for us to be really free, we need some property. Where's that property going to come from? And so that sets up this tension because the, the British crown, they were afraid of expanding to start a war with native tribes, which were bigger, more powerful. And so they wanted to contain this desire for more land. So that was sort of what was happening there in Bacon's Rebellion. And I think uh, it was pointed out in the chat by Eric, this was actually one of the key issues in the American Revolution, is that the British crown didn't want the colonies to go past the, um, the Alleghenies. And, uh, and they, they wanted more land. They wanted to keep going. Any other thoughts on this moment of Bacon's Rebellion or we keep moving? Yeah, I'd like to offer one. Sure. Yeah, I see a lot, and I think back in school, I mean, Bacon's Rebellion didn't get a lot of coverage, but it was more, I think more that this was the roots of uh, kind of this desire for freedom that led to the American Revolution. But to me, this is the beginning of where myth is beginning to uh, be greater than fact that uh, you know we're we're now starting to uh, really not deal with the reality of history but simply the perspective particularly through white privilege and entitlement absolutely and the way i view it is there are these contradictions like on the one hand bacon's rebellion was declaring the rights of the people it was saying these elites shouldn't have all the power, but they couldn't see that their concept of rights was at someone else's expense, right? So there's this contradiction. And the same thing happens, of course, in the American Revolution, right? It's like, oh, well, we want freedom and brotherhood and rights. Oh, but not, <laughs> but slavery, let's not touch that, right? So you have these contradictions. All right, two more volunteers are needed because we're jumping forward to Richmond. Um, and while you, uh, we got Tanisha, do we have one more? Oh, we got, um, I don't know who that is, Radeski. Um, so Richmond, 1877, the readjuster party was a short-lived multiracial political organization that was born after the reconstruction era. So we've jumped ahead. We jumped past uh, um, the civil war, past the Confederacy and it, but the readjuster party made sweeping changes to racist institutions in the state of Virginia, but its impact was blunted, limited by the resurgence of the plantation owner's power. So our first reader, is going to play William Mahone. Tanisha, you want to read uh, William Mahone? Yes. I am William Mahone. I was a Confederate general in the Civil War just a few years ago. But in 1881, I will be elected as a U.S. Senator from Virginia on the Reed Juster party ticket. And William E. Cameron will be will become the Rejuster re governor, both with multiracial support. The Rejuster party unites colored and white working people and was founded to, to the break of power of wealth and established privilege. The main goal of the Rejuster party is to readjust the debt of Virginia. Before the Civil War, Virginia borrowed huge amounts of money to develop the infrastructure of the state. Now that the war is over, the wealthy landowners want Virginians to pay the debt in full. Keep going. But we will win majorities in both houses and the governorship based on the idea that debt shall be refinanced to benefit the average people. 
We also defend universal voting rights for all men of any race, regardless of wealth. We didn't stay in power for long, but we showed it was possible to build a multiracial alliance in Virginia. Great, thank you. And our second volunteer, you wanna read Roberta Comrie? Well, my name is Roberta Comrie and I am a school teacher in Petersburg. I'm a Negro woman and supporter of the Rear Justice Party. Together with my white neighbors, we have changed the course of this community and state. The readjusters established public schools for white and colored children and invested heavily in them. A colored school teacher is something that would have been impossible previously, but here I am. The readjuster party also increased funding for our public universities and established Virginia State University. The, they as the as yet only state supported college for colors in the US. Keep going. Plus the readjuster, plus the readjuster government banned the dreaded whipping post and the poll tax, a payment required to vote. The readjuster black majority city council in Danville even established a multiracial police force. It is a new day in Virginia. How many folks have heard of the readjuster party before? No. I haven't. I haven't. Right. A few people, but yeah, this is this is a, um a interesting moment in Virginia history, right? And yeah. let's I'm gonna quickly do the lessons and then we can jump into the discussion. So one is when I first started doing work with Virginia organizing. People said, oh, that's just the way it's always been here in Virginia. And then, but Virginia actually has a rich history of multiracial alliance, right? But this has been hidden. Two is that racism is not um, monolithic. It's not omnipotent, right? We can actually fight racism and we can change racist institutions through organized struggle and power. And the other thing is that some of these racist systems are not as old as we think. It wasn't till uh, the, I think it's the 1902 constitution of Virginia that many of these things the readjusters fought for were undone, right? So these weren't ancient, uh, legacies, they were, they were new re uh, reforms to undo this work. Uh, Carolyn, you have your hand up. Do you have something to ask or, or say or contribute? You asked who'd heard of the Readjuster Party and I forgot to take oh. it down. No, no, no problem. Well, what do you guys think? I mean, what What's interesting or or shocking about this moment? What did you learn? Uh, this is Barbara Harris. What's shocking to me, and uh, I'm 69, and uh, I've done a lot of reading in my life, and what's shocking to me is that none of what I've heard in the last 30 minutes have I ever heard in all my research and reading. None of it. It is one of the saddest things about this country is how history is abused and misused. Um, you know, the readjuster party was new to me uh, three years ago when we started this researching this project. And one of the interesting things is there's hardly any books. There's some scholarly articles and things. There's hardly any books written about Readjuster Party. Karen? I wanted to know something about the more. What was that? You cut out. I couldn't hear you. I wanted to know about the multiracial alliance. Because uh, I think my my wife is going to school and they're teaching the same subject, but they, they were saying that the, uh, a black man, I mean, a black person couldn't marry a white person, 
or they'll be kicked out of Virginia. And that's right. That, we're going to come to that next. That that doesn't happen till the 1920s. Well, I mean, this is what this is one of the things that happens is the readjusters undo many of the things that were put into place by the the um, uh, Virginia law under the Confederacy. So they, you know, there was discussions about even women voting, but they allowed all men, black, white, um, to vote, whether they had property or not. Um, they, they built, uh, they allowed blacks on juries. They had a multiracial police force in Danville, <laughs> you know, at a time when it's kind of shocking. So they did these radical things. And, I, you know, unfortunately, we don't know a lot of like what the organizational life of the readjuster party was, like how much interaction between races happened inside the party. Um, you know, we have some, in, there's some images of black and white elected readjusters sitting together in the, in the, in the house. The other thing I want to say is, even though it was a short period of time, the readjuster control of Virginia lasted longer than the Confederacy. Like, I mean, you think about the Confederacy is like this thing, oh, we've got to talk about the Confederacy and our legacy and the history and our pride. The readjuster party lasted longer than they did. But where, where's the monuments? Where's the parades? It is said, I don't know if it's true, but yeah, oh yes, it's in the, it's in the chat. Uh, Carolyn put it there. Mahone is the only Confederate uh, general who never got a statue because they said he was a traitor, right? So um, there's a lot more uh, we could talk about the readjuster party, but I think we're going to keep moving. The lesson is this, like, there's always a chance for solidarity. There's always a chance. It doesn't mean it was perfect. It doesn't mean there weren't tensions. But even in the period after the Civil War, they had a Confederate general as a major leader of a multiracial political party whose goal was to break the backs of the elites. <laughs> so if that could happen, like, what could we do, right? We should be able to do some stuff. Um, we have one more scenario. I need two more volunteers. Do I have two volunteers? Okay, we got Rick. We need one more, and I'm going to read the, the narration. So we're jumping forward. Richmond, 1924. So in the 20th century, a new pseudoscience emerges. In other words, it's not a real science. It is uh, racism that is... Uh, pretending to be science, and it emerges to try to justify racism as natural. It's called eugenics. What you may not know is that Virginia is one of the places where eugenics develops at UVA and thrives in the state house. Virginia enacted one of the earliest eugenics policies in the world. So, uh, our first volunteer, Rick, you get to read Walter Plecker. Oh, great. I think he's one of the great villains of history. <laughs> he is one of the really nastiest <laughs> guys ever. Sorry. No reflection on Rick. Okay, here we go. My name is Walter Plecker, and I'm the registrar of the Virginia Board of Vital Statistics. It's my job to enforce the Racial Integrity Acts of 1924 and 1930. I'm also a leader of the Anglo-Saxon Clubs of America, which helped write these laws and promote white racial superiority. These laws are very important because they force a separation between the races in Virginia, which is the natural order. 
First, we require all birth certificates to identify every child as white or color. And for the first time in law, we define white as someone who has no trace whatsoever of any blood other than Caucasian. This is what is sometimes called the one drop rule. The laws uh, also ban the disgusting practice of race mixing and marriage between races. Thanks to these laws and our work and that of scientists at the University of Virginia, our government will sterilize 6,683 people who were deemed mentally deficient because of their race. Okay, and we have a second volunteer. Anybody, anybody, this is the last one. I'll go ahead and take it. Great. I am Jane Taylor, a member of the Metapanai tribe, which is right up the street from where I live. <laughs> My family and ancestors have lived in Virginia for more than 15,000 years. Our land was stolen and our people killed by settlers beginning with the first European settlers. Our people and many other native nations here in Virginia signed treaties with the English colonies and the British King before US independence. But those treaties were routinely broken and violated. Now Virginia has passed this Racial Integrity Act, which classifies all native people as color. It not only erases our traditions and culture, but it does not allow us to have federal recognition of our tribe and the rights that come with that. Our tribe and other Virginia tribes will not, will not gain federal recognition again until 2018. 2018. I mean, in other words, like yesterday. So a couple lessons, then we'll dig in. One, the shaping of racial identity is not fixed. It's not set in stone in the past. It's defined by laws and practices. And many of these things like banning so-called race mixing was a modern development. Two, native people are still a part of Virginia society despite attempts at genocide and erasure. This idea that native people were here, but they're gone, so sorry. No, as Tanisha pointed out, the Mattapani tribe is still exists in, and, and native people exist and live in Virginia. And they're fighting for their rights even today. So the other lesson is that everyone suffers, right, at on the altar of white supremacy. So in the in the scenario, we mentioned the 6,600 people who were sterilized under Plecker. Does anyone know what race they were? Sorry for American, that American and, and Native American for the most part. Melungeons. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Michelle. I just said Melungeons, which was something I learned about since I've been with Virginia organizing. Crazy. Yeah. You want to say about uh, who the Melungeons are? Well, I don't, I don't really understand it because it's so mind boggling, but people who live in Appalachia are declared in this category of race and were segregated, their kids not allowed to go to school, all this kind of nuts stuff. Right. Yeah, it was a group of folks who had the physical characteristics of, of whites, but were considered somehow uh, a mud race or something different and had were discriminated in yeah. Appalachia. Yeah, the thing that about yeah. oh me. just uh, the thing about these sterilizations is the vast majority of them were of white people because there's no need to protect the purity of black of coloreds right it's like known that they're not pure it was about sterilizing white people who they believed had low IQs who had impure bloodlines, all these kinds of crazy concepts, right? So here's the white supremacist ideology 
is actually promoting a system to sterilize white people. Carolyn, do you have something to, to add, Carolyn, or a question? Yeah, I was just going to mention that the, the court case that went to the Supreme Court was actually a white woman. That's and right. she was described as being mentally deficient and that her mother and her child was, despite the fact that her child graduated with honors, but they were poor. And yep. she got probably raped by uh, an employer and they just didn't want to deal with it. So that's how they fixed it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yep. And I should also say that the, of the famous loving case, um, you know, was an example, you know, it was actually just very recently, only a few years ago that these, some of these things, even though they were unenforceable, some of these laws stayed on the books this idea of registering race on on public records and things like that. Uh, all right. Is there uh, a way to um, my grandmother, my great great grandmother comes from Pocahontas era. And we have been trying for years to locate her parents, siblings, anybody, we cannot get past her. Um, and we were actually told by one of the genealogists in our uh, family that she was a Pocahontas time. She did live in Jamestown at one point. Um, she was eventually slow, uh, sold over into slavery. Um, she worked for Judge Hanley. We know that much. But as far as finding anything else having to do with her, it's nothing there to be found. It is really hard to track those genealogies and you know, there's a lot of some books written about how to do it. Um, but yeah, especially folks who were enslaved, it's extremely hard to track. Um, Harvard recently published a database that has some information, but um, but yeah, that's like an expertise question. Uh, you need some yeah. help. Well, right? I think it was more than that. Uh, Plecker actually made obliterated any records, you know, the, the issue oh, yeah. of uh, tribes gaining recognition, you have, yeah. and, and you have to establish that linkage. And what Plecker did was basically just obliterate records of, of generations of, of, of folks, you know, Native Americans, uh, uh, you know, African Americans, and, and mentally people, the, like the asylum in Lynchburg did a lot of these, uh, uh, sterilizations of, of folks they called who were mentally deficient. One, one other point, you know, when Adolf Hitler put together a commission when they were dealing with the with how to eradicate the Jews, and they did a lot of they used a lot of Heckler's uh, works. But the thing that was so ironic, they were trying to define what does it mean to be Aryan. How many generations back do you go that there would be Jewish blood? They rejected the American version because they thought the one drop theory was too restrictive. That's so, right. I mean, you know, even the Nazis, <laughs> as evil as they were, uh, you know, uh, would not adopt the, the, the cruelty of the American system. And I think the key point here is that all of this stuff was nonsense. It made no sense. It was arbitrary they invented these ideas. So for instance, the, do you know what the Pocahontas rule was? So based, you know, Virginia has these, I forget how many families, the founding families of Virginia, you know, there's all these like elites who tra trace their families back to John Rolfe and all these guys who have held power and wealth and property for generations. Well, many of them for years claimed to be descendants of Pocahontas and John Rolfe, right? They were like, oh, and they like to think of themselves as like, we're the inheritors of these native people who we wiped out. Well, John, the Plecker rule of one drop causes a little bit of a problem, right? 
if you have all these white Virginia elites who say we're descendant from Pocahontas, well, there's your one drop. So what they did in the law is they wrote a thing except for descendants of Pocahontas. I mean, it's absurd. It makes no sense. They're basically like, you must be pure white, except for us, because we come from Pocahontas and we all good. It doesn't make any sense. So again, we have to resist this idea that somehow race is natural, race is real. And to say, like, this stuff is, yeah, it's nonsense. And they're using it to protect the power of an elite. So um, we're going to wrap up the history part here. We're going to start, you know, but I want to look back a little bit and say we looked at four scenarios. In the longer version of the training, we have six scenarios. We could do 12 scenarios. There are all these moments in Virginia that have not just shaped institutional racism and resistance to racism, but have helped define race and racism in the whole United States, and, and in fact, in many ways in the whole world. And by looking at them, we, we want to find these uh, deeper understanding that race is not real, but racism is. And that resistance is always possible. Racism is shaped as much by our resistance as by these institutions. And that inspires us for what is our vision going to be for the next 400 years? We just finished 400 years. Of, of oppression, of racism, of conquest. And so now we have to build a vision of what the heck is Virginia gonna be going forward? What is our vision of a new Virginia? And that's where I'm gonna hand it over to Megan for the next part. All right, so this is the small groups part. So um, now that, as Libra said, now that we've seen a look of, uh, the history of race and racism, we're going to discuss the future. And so um, the question is, if uh, imagine that you can snap your fingers and achieve racial justice in this state, what would that look like? So imagine that we snap our fingers and all of a sudden, uh, Virginia has no more racism and there's racial justice. What does that look like to you? So we're going to get into small groups. Amanda's got small groups ready. And Libra, how long are we going to take? 20 minutes? Um, I think we should take about 12 minutes so we have time to kind of hear back from people. And I think uh, be prepared to report back. So if, if one person could be ready to um, tell us what you talked about. We good? Amanda, are you ready? Yeah. OK, we're going to quickly hear what everybody talked about. So. Um, can we start with whoever was in room one? Could somebody tell us what y'all discussed? Hi, this is Barbara Harris again. Um, Marissa, Erica, and I, um, we had a really good conversation about what we view the future being like. And for us, it's kind of bleak because we felt in, as a group, as a consensus that um, to begin with conversations and dialogue that goes on in the back rooms of government, not just government restaurants and whatnot, because that's where most uh, decisions are made, that uh, the people that need to be involved, the people that need to change are never gonna be a part of that scenario. And that the stealing of wealth from uh, uh, less uh, economically, uh, elevated people still continues throughout the state and that there are generations of power, money, and archaic ideals that are passed on. I still think it's about a group of people and that there's going to be a need for decades of relearning of behavior and people have to take ownership of the part that they each play and stand bigoted no matter what race they are. Great, thanks so much, Barbara. Um, all right, how about group two? 
Um, could you share one or two things that y'all came up with? Um, Brandy and I were in group two. And uh, one, of the, one of our common thoughts about that was the need for reshaping all of our, every institution in the US because there, there's inherent systemic racism in each. And um, we also thought that, that from local level that there's more potential for that than, than at the you know, federal level at this point in terms of things being kind of stuck. I don't know. Brandy, did that capture it or? Yeah, I think you captured it perfectly. Just um, remembering to, in our institutions, decenter capitalism and center human needs. And that's a great starting place. I think. Great. Thank you, Brandy and Mark. About group three, one or two things that y'all came away with. Is anybody in room three? While we pick up. Oh. Yes, Carolyn's going to report back. Oh, okay. Well, we agreed that, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of different things that need to be worked on. Um, but I um, knew about a uh, potential bill on housing reparations that may be coming up in uh, the next General Assembly. Uh, and so I was explaining about that. And I, I found a link and do you think it'll paste for me? No. Gonna try it one more time. So at any rate, the idea is that it would allow um, people who had lived in, whose families had lived in areas that had been redlined to uh, have access to the money needed to own a house or if they did own it to um, re um, repair and bring it uh, up to what they wanted it to be. And um, thereby um, accumulate the wealth the way most Americans do. Great, thanks for that report back, Carolyn. All right, so group four is Jara, Jada, Mary, Megan, and Sarah. Um, and we're kind of running short on time. We've only got 10 minutes left. So if you could just talk, just share one thing that y'all came away with. Okay, so my group, we really just um, talked about racial justice and what we pictured it to look like. And we basically all said, it's all, it all comes back to education. Um, we just felt like if people just educated themselves, kind of changed that traditional thinking, it would lead to better things such as um, inclusion and equity, just instead of equality and just understanding people from different backgrounds. Um, so that's like the short brief of it. Awesome, thanks Jada. All right, how about group five? That's Michelle, Rachel, Troy, Shauna, and Tanisha. Yeah, uh, we uh, discuss uh, the peace and fear is uh, with uh, we live off fear, you know, you kind of scared to get around people and 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 talk to people, but without the fear, we can all be peaceful as a community in Virginia. So that was our one of our things was peace. Awesome, thanks so much, Trey. You all right, group six Mary, Pat, Rachel, Tyran, and Vicky. Okay. Um, yeah, we talked about um, that we have to take ownership of our citizenship and if we could become more like Virginia organizing where we're um, constantly vigilant in order to have a democracy and save our democracy to celebrate our successes. Um, 
like abortion rights that need a lot of attention right now, social security. Um, uh, so our key word for equity would be to be vigilant. Um, also, we had a suggestion that as we reshape education um, for a more diverse perspectives, uh, we should also build things like monuments to the readjuster party. <laughs> That's it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Pat. All right. And last but not least, group seven. Or was that group seven? Um, that was Rick, Pat, uh, I think Sharon and Kensington. Sharon and uh, Carrington. OK. Um, Rick, are you reporting? Who from your group is reporting? I don't think we got that far enough to, to have a reporter. I, I'll throw something in and then the folks can add. Uh, a lot of what everyone said, I think uh, education is, is sort of the foundation. Uh, of course, part of that is that we, we see a vision where uh, in the classroom, uh, you know, teachers and students are, are see themselves as, as human beings, that you're not just, the teacher is not afraid of the students, uh, the fear factor. And, and all the students are treated equally. Um, I think there was a broad feeling that uh, uh, of unity and harmony and people really living together. Uh, also a feeling of just as Virginia did, we need to go through and identify and purge all the laws, policies that have set up this uh, artificial uh, society of, of, uh, in terms of black and white. Um, uh, don't know if anybody wants to add anything else in there, but I mean, I, even to the point, wealth, uh, several people have talked about the restoration of wealth, whether that's through some form of reparations, but uh, uh, we'd, we'd like to see a really real level playing field with real equal opportunity uh, and the teaching of real history. Anyone want to add to that? That was great, Rick. Thanks so much. All right. Well, I hope he's um. Um, I got something to say. This is Ivy. Um, I don't know if anybody said anything about ending um transgenerational trauma. Uh, I guess slavery is is trauma, and they keep cycling over and over and over. And uh, as far as um, early child development, really supporting the kids to be in a calm environment and teaching them, you know, not, not to be in the uh, environment that is absolutely traumatic. Thank you. Ivy, please put it. Yeah, intergenerational trauma and childhood development. That's important. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everyone for participating. I'm just, I'm so glad that we did that. And Libro just went off mute. Great. I I just want to um, thank all the readers and volunteers and everyone in the small groups. I had an opportunity to jump from group to group, and everyone was having rich conversation. Um, Part of what we're trying to do here is to think big and long-term. These moments of history teach us that we didn't get into this, um, you know, in, a, in an election cycle, right? This is 400 years of systems of oppression and laws and policies that help get us to where we're at. And our vision for the future for justice and equality that includes uh, native people and black people and immigrants of all kinds. And, and like, we have to think long-term and big. And, and some people were frustrated of like, oh, well, we're just creating a utopia. How do we get there? But we have to have a vision before we have a strategy. And you all are in the right place. Like you're in Virginia organizing. 
that's an organization that has a commitment to values of equality, equity, and justice, and has an attitude towards making some big changes. And I think that um, part of this exercise is to understand where we're coming from in order to get a better vision of where we're going. And that those small little fights you have in your school board, in your county commission, et cetera, that's part, those are stepping stones in a strategy to really transform Virginia in a way that everybody of every race has justice and has opportunity. And, you know, you all named it. It's about, you know, thinking about these big issues like housing and land and health and education. But ultimately, it's about power. And it's about the people really having power instead of a small elite. So I hope this was a helpful exercise. I always enjoy join, you know, having you all for this, this process. And, um, you know, if anything, it tells us that like, the, f- the future is ours to make. Um, I was saying in one of the small groups that when we started this exercise like three years ago, first time we did this, no one could have imagined that, you know, we could take down the Confederate statues. In fact, Joe Sakos and I were joking about it, like, you know, what, what, what are we going to do to get rid of this statue? And, and now they're coming down. They're coming down all over Virginia. Like, we couldn't have imagined it. So I think that's, we have to dare to be bold to really think about a racially just future and the elements of what that looks like. And then together we got to go out and do it. So nice, thank you. And it's great seeing everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Libra. Libra. Bro, yes. Libra, thank you very much. Thank you. And to you, Megan and Eric. Thanks. Thank yes. you, Libra. To everybody. Thank you. Thank you. you all have so a good keep night. working. Take care. Night. Thanks, good night. night. Good night, all. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Alerts for pass. Bye. Activate for pass.